Hey everybody, and welcome back to MOPA in Focus uh, for our new installment, looking at the still life in photography or picturing the still life in photography. If you didn't get a chance to join us last week, we took a look at writing and uh, pairing images with words. Uh, and each week, uh, we're gonna use the opportunity here with MOPA in Focus to take a look at an artist that's in our collection or one of our current exhibitions and to chat a little bit about the big idea uh, behind their work, uh, as well as how you can explore that idea or that theme through the collection at the Museum of Photographic Arts. I want to thank everybody for joining us virtually, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Kevin Lindy, uh, and I'm MOPA's Manager of Adult and Digital Engagement. And I'm really excited for this spot because it gets to really bring together all the wonderful things that we have at MOPA. Uh, since a lot of you are tuning in virtually, all of you are turning, tuning in virtually, uh, wherever you may be, uh, this is a way for us to take I like to think all the wonderful things that we have at the museum, from the collection to the library to our exhibitions, and to bring it all to you wherever you might be tuning in. Um, so as I mentioned, this week we're going to be taking a look at still life. Uh, and still life, I think, is um, a fantastic theme for uh, the current situation that we all find ourselves in. All of us are surrounded by uh, so many things, right, uh, in our daily lives, uh, as well as the objects and the things that um, mean a lot to us. Uh, uh, most of us are at home, um, and so you probably have objects laying around that you've been noticing a lot recently. Um, and so I think for today, a great way for us to um, sort of take a look at that broad idea of still life in photography, we're going to sort of take a step back in time. Uh, we're going to go back to some of the earliest photographs uh, that we're lucky to have as part of the permanent collection at the Museum of Photographic Arts. And we're going to walk through photographic history and really take a look at different ways still life has been approached uh, through, through photography. Um, and so for our first image, I'm gonna go ahead and pull this up here. We have this image, uh, and um, if you check out this, some of you might be familiar with this image, but others, maybe not so much. Uh, we're actually looking at, in this image, uh, one of the first, or some of the first, photographs that were ever created. Uh, this image is by uh, 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 an inventor, photographer, and scientist, uh, Henry Fox Talbot. Uh, and it, he was an Englishman who was really sort of playing around at the very beginning of photography, playing around with light-sensitive chemistry, uh, with optics, and really his goal was um, how do we create or how do we make a photograph that's permanent? Uh, he wasn't necessarily the first to make a permanent photograph, um, but what he did was um, is he essentially pioneered a process that later allowed us uh, to have things like the negative um, or to make copies or to make prints of a photograph. Uh, so this image right here, again, keeping on that theme of still life, um, we have uh, what looks like just a series of shelves uh, with uh, all sorts of objects on it. Um, he called these objects china, right? So they're porcelain, uh, some of them are bowls, some of them are vases. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that um, he sort of is sending us a little bit of inspiration through time. Uh, this photograph was taken in 1844 in England, um, and for some of the logistics behind it, um, if any of you have tried to take a still life photograph before, you know, it's all about framing and composition and getting your lighting sort of tuned in and dialed in. Um, Interestingly enough, this photograph had to be taken outside because uh, photography at that point was still very slow, very time intensive, um, exposure times were very slow. Um, and so he actually constructed these shelves outside in broad daylight um, and 
had a backdrop um, and arranged these objects on the shelf in order to make this photograph. Uh, and the photograph probably took still quite a bit of time to develop. Um, this was an in-camera paper process. So in other words, the negative itself in the camera uh, was made of paper uh, and it was a very early kind of photographic process. Um, but he needed that broad daylight, that broad, uh, bright sunlight, uh, in order to go ahead and actually be able to take this photograph. Um, and I want to share with all of you a quote by him, which really sort of, I think, speaks through the ages, especially to the time that we're in right now. Um, and so he wrote about this series uh, that the whole cabinet of a virtuoso might be photographed. The more strange and fantastic the forms, the more advantage in having their pictures given instead of their descriptions. However numerous the objects, however complicated the arrangement, the camera depicts them all at once. Um, and I think for a little bit of context, what he was really sort of getting at is that up until this point, prior to photography, Still life was a theme in the visual arts, um, but of course we were most familiar with painting. Um, and so of course a painter time intensively would go about rendering, right, interpreting what they were seeing um, in order to um, uh, either paint it or draw it. Um, but for Fox Talbot at this time, uh, to be able to place these objects and for all of them to be recorded by the camera all at once, uh, no matter how complicated they look or how complex their form is, um, that was a wholly new thing, right? That was an exciting thing for everyone, uh, and certainly for Fox Talbot. Um, and so this image, um, I think also in line with still life, um, you know, because photography was very messy early on, and again, took a long time to be able to take a photograph, um, objects and therefore still lifes of objects were some really some of the first subjects um, in early photographs because they have the advantage of not moving like people do, uh, and certainly crowds of people. Group photographs came a little bit later uh, in, in photography. Um, so this is one of the actually the earliest photographic images that we have in the collection. It's not the earliest, but it's among some of the earliest. Um, and that's really what I love about the collection at the Museum of Photographic Arts is it provides us all an opportunity to really look back in time, look at what other artists have sort of used and explored um, through photography, and then for all of us to get a little bit of inspiration around it as well. Uh, Another image too that we have in the collection, if we sort of move forward in time a little bit, um, and is this image by uh, the photographer Karl Blasfeld. Karl Blasfeld was a scientist and photographer, a German living in Berlin in the early 1900s. Um, and while this might not be the typical still life, still life is such a broad category, right? Um, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of different ways that you can approach a still life. Um, and that's what I, why I love looking at the collection, because we kind of see all the different shades and hues of what we can consider a still life uh, in photography. And so this image, Carl Blasfeld was looking at this, um, looking at specimens, botanical specimens in particular, as a botanist, he was really interested in that um, and how the camera can capture details that were often difficult for uh, to to render. Right. Um, we could clearly draw something, but to draw something is to interpret it. Um, and while photography can interpret things as well, we all know that there's whatever's in front of the camera and then there's the decisions that we're making as the photographers. Um, Carl Blasfeld loved the level of detail and the level of rendering that you could get from photographing sometimes these really, really tiny specimens um, in, in botany uh, and in nature. Uh, and so he created a series of photographs that um, really show us the beautiful sort of intricate details of some of these specimens. And then of course we're really familiar with sometimes more uh, more common or sort of 
everyday examples of still life. Uh, and I love this image. Uh, this image is by the photographer, the New York photographer, Harold Feinstein. Uh, and Harold Feinstein uh, lived in the Northeast in the United States uh, during the 20th century. Um, and he uh, created a lot of different kinds of work, but uh, his, his style was early on, specifically um, street photography, right? Uh, these beautiful everyday scenes of what life was like in the city uh, and how he was seeing it in some of the, uh, some of the neighborhoods and the communities that he lived in. Um, and this image um, I love because I think it's a really approachable uh, example of what a still life can be. Um, we can see it's a bowl of fruit, uh, a bowl of apples in particular. We have three apples there sitting on this windowsill um, and because it's an interior scene looking out the window we have this wonderful filtered light coming in through the window and then of course we have that textural detail too of the lace curtains on either side um, but you can see that a still life can be something as simple as uh, perhaps it's uh, an everyday scene that you have in your environment around you, right? Uh, as a lot of us are uh, distancing ourselves quite a bit recently um, and spending more time at home. Um, I think this image, even though it was taken over 60 years ago, 70 years ago, uh, can really provide all of us some inspiration for how we can approach still life literally from the comfort of home. Um, I also love this example too because a lot of times if we're thinking about a still life, we think that we have to have some sort of complicated lighting set up or we have to have studio lighting uh, or we have to have the latest and greatest camera. Um, but photographers have shown us that that's not the case necessarily. Um, we can use something as simple as natural light and something as simple as objects that we have laying around the house. Um, and it's our approach, right? It's the composition, it's the time of day, which informs the quality of light. Um, and all of these different things can come together to actually create a really beautiful still life, a really, really beautiful scene. And so still lifes can be um, an opportunity to uh, convey something about ordinary everyday objects. Uh, as we saw with Fox Talbot, they can be to sort of record things that are maybe difficult to draw or interpret. Um, or as Bloss felt, maybe sometimes these fine and minute details of the natural world around us, right? Uh, we've probably all taken photographs uh, of things where we're just astounded by the details that we notice in the photograph that we perhaps didn't notice um, just by looking at the object. The camera has a wonderful way of doing that. Um, but other photographers have approached it, um, the idea of a still life, a little bit differently. Um, they, they use it as an opportunity for us to meditate on the objects, on their meaning, or they construct a meaning for us, um, for us to, to, to meditate on, right? To think about. Um, and this work is a beautiful series by the artist named Joan Myers. Uh, and Joan Myers uh, created these beautiful platinum prints um, of objects that she found and encountered uh, in Manzanar. And now Manzanar uh, is a site in California uh, where Japanese Americans were uh, interned in World War II. Um, and so it's a very difficult history and a difficult past for all of us. Um, and when she was visiting the site in the 1970s, um, at that point it had been abandoned after World War II, um, and she was looking around the site, not only to document the site, um, but what she realized also is that there were all these objects that were still left. Um, and these objects were everyday objects uh, that were used by those who were held at the camps uh, here in California. Um, those provide us with this beautiful window into everyday life during a really difficult time in history. Um, and they really show us uh, also the passage of time as well. Um, we can see in this image, there's a broken piece of china of, 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 of porcelain. Uh, and then we also have this spoon and the spoon is rusted and, and weathered with time. Um, and um, 
she used this as a way of sort of, uh, if you could say, a visual archaeology, um, as a way to uh, explore uh, what was left of, of everyone's experience there, um, especially when those experiences were often very painful um, <clears throat> for many of those who were, who were in those camps. Um, so you can see a still life can actually have us think or uh, transport us back to a time uh, and think about what an everyday experience would have been like for those who were there. Of course, there's uh, with um, other artists uh, have used still life in really creative ways. Uh, so this is an image by Joe Whaley. Uh, and uh, Joe Whaley uh, is a photo-based artist uh, that uh, has explored using uh, old images and specimens of butterflies to combine them. Um, and she also creates still life like this, uh, still lives like this. Um, and this one is called Overripe Population. Um, and it's this really beautiful tableau, this beautiful still life uh, of we can see a pomegranate right and we all know that the pomegranate is filled with all of these different seeds but we can see it's sort of uh, over ripened as the title suggests and split open uh, and then we have the seeds are arranged on this backdrop which has this beautiful color gradient uh, and the color gradient kind of provides this wonderful contrast right uh, with uh, with the the red of the pomegranate and the green of the uh, of the leaves and the stem. Um, and so um, in this one, you can see that the still life can be approached just on a flat surface, right? Um, and, and using, again, everyday objects. Um, but it's, in, it's how uh, Joe Whaley went about arranging those objects, right? Um, by splitting the pomegranate open by arranging the seeds in really interesting ways um, to create this sort of textural backdrop, right? This textural pattern. Um, we can see that still lives can be approached in lots of different ways. And the title, right, of, of, of Joe Whaley's piece, Overripe Populations, Overripe Population, um, again, is um, kind of has us think about, well, what exactly is she maybe speaking to uh, in this still life, right? Um, what, is the, what is the meaning of it? Um, and the thing that I really love about uh, this opportunity with you all today is that we can take a look at this broad idea, this broad theme in photography, uh, how different artists have explored it, but also we can come all the way up through contemporary artists who are living and working today and how they're continuing to sort of push at the edges, right, of what we might con consider a still life uh, in photography. Um, and currently at the museum, even though we can't be there physically today, um, I wanted to share with you all a photographer that we have uh, in, uh, in uh, our current exhibition, um, Out of the Shadows, Contemporary Chinese Photography. Um, and the uh, name of the artist is Hong Lei, uh, and Hong Lei, as you can see, creates these beautiful still life images, um, which are uh, use these really intricate objects. Um, and from afar, what's really interesting is that they look picture perfect. They look like these beautiful, uh, beautifully composed arrangements of typically natural objects, um, However, when you look closer at the objects uh, and at the still life itself, uh, you can see that there's something a little bit different about them. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and actually full screen this for everyone here. And you can see how we actually see the objects are suspended by wires, right? Um, so the artist is making sure that they're calling out the artificiality, right, of a still life. Because we often want to make a still life to mimic nature, but still lives are created by us, right? <clears throat> and so uh, we can see that the things are suspended. Um, there's even some really sort of uh, interesting, um, interesting sort of specimens in there. We have flies buzzing around these pomegranates. Uh, we have the branches broken. In this image, uh, we have a snake. Uh, and in this one, right, a field of butterflies as well as a snake, um, but uh, again, there's something that's sort of a bit different, a bit off about the images. Um, 
And I think that's really interesting because uh, Hong Lei essentially is making this comment uh, on still lifes and on the tradition of still life, specifically with reference to the artistic tradition that the artist uh, grew up within, right? In the Eastern tradition, in China, uh, in other parts of East Asia, there was this refinement of how do you capture the beauty of nature in a quintessential and perfect way. Um, but we all know that um, sometimes it's really difficult. You can't recreate something uh, perfectly. And so for him, he's kind of using this idea to sort of poke at that idea. Um, he's using these objects to say, <clears throat> I'm creating this thing that looks perfect, perhaps a bit from afar, but the closer you get to it, you see some imperfections or you see some objects or items that kind of are in conversation with each other, right? Like the butterflies and the snake or the branch that has a bit of dripping, uh, dripping blood on it. Um, so there are these really sort of interesting aspects to it uh, that he tries to incorporate. Um, if anybody has any questions, we would love to hear your thoughts, anything you might be curious about. Uh, maybe it's something that's in the collection at the museum, uh, or uh, maybe it's something that you saw today. So make sure to use the comments there uh, to go ahead and shoot us over a question that you have. Um, and uh, because we're all uh, currently not at the museum, I want to encourage everybody to head on over to mopa.org um, because if you like today's program uh, and if you love photography, we would love for you to check out our educational section on the museum's website. So if you go to mopa.org forward slash educate, you'll see more resources about still life, uh, but you'll also see other, uh, other content that's exploring all of these big ideas in photography. Uh, and of course, we couldn't bring all of this to you uh, without your support. Uh, so if you like today's program and you wanna support continuing to bring you some really cool content, exploring the collections and the exhibitions at the museum, make sure you go to mopa.org forward slash support uh, and anything that you can contribute helps us keep bringing you this awesome content. So I hope you all are gonna join us next week uh, for another MOPA in Focus, where again, we'll be sort of exploring this big, broad idea in photography through the collection and the current exhibitions at the museum. I wish everyone well to stay safe uh, and to try any of these ideas that you see uh, in the comfort of your own home and make sure you share them with us online. Uh, thanks everybody for joining today and we'll see you next week.